session. Um, so we've got our transition to net zero seminar session today, and we're going to have a panel session on the topic of um, direct air capture. And the question is, uh, could direct air capture technology save us from climate change? So slightly controversial topic for some. <laughs> um, and today we've got four panel speakers. Um, we've got uh, uh, Dr. Mindert, Van de Speck from Harriet Watt University, and three of um, people we we're probably all quite familiar with. We've got Professor Martin Trussler, uh, Dr. Ronnie Pinney, and also Professor Paul Fennell. And each person's going to provide first a commentary on their thoughts and perspective on direct air capture and the role it might have in the future. And then after that, um, we'll have a, the floor open to questions um, and the panel members will answer those questions. So if you've got questions, um, please feel free to type them in the chat window and then I can read them out at the end. Alternatively, you can put your hand up using the hand up icon and then you can unmute yourself um, and ask your question verbally. So uh, we'll first have Dr. Mindert van der Speck speak first. So Mindert is an Associate Professor of Chemical Engineering at Harriet Watt University and he's the Associate Director of CO2 University utilization at the Harriet Watt Research Centre for Carbon Solutions. Um, his work focuses on the process systems engineering and analysis of adsorbent based uh, direct air capture and CO2 capture utilization and storage technology. So uh, the floor is yours. Uh, mind it so please uh, start off with your commentary <laughs> yeah so so given that that i do work indeed on adsorbent based direct air capture i would be a fool to say that there is no no place for that in uh, in, in a future net zero um scenario um and 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 actually um i'm 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 very optimistic I guess I'm, I'm one of these technology optimists, but then again, I'm I, I maybe a, a bit of a societal pessimist or realist. So I, I think we'll have a, a very hard time reaching net zero in 2050, um, like true net zero. Um, so so I would say that we need all the um, uh, all the uh, the technology solutions that that we that we can use. Um, I, I wouldn't shy away of, of using any one that that that, that may be available. Um, I mean, for me, that's that's pretty clear cut. Um, I, I, I actually wanted to talk a little bit about something else. So, so solid sorbent direct air capture is uh, is one of the fields that I work in, and I wanted to talk about two companies uh, called Climeworks and Global Thermostat, who both um, market, develop and market these kind of technologies. And I wanted to look a little bit in, uh, more into what they uh, or, or how they have progressed so far. Uh, and the difference between between them. So, so what I found very interesting is that uh, Climeworks, for instance, took a you know they, they took a very pragmatic and hands-on um, uh, approach. So they, they took an existing adsorbent and they built a process. Uh, the founders being chem uh, sorry mechanical engineers rather than chemical engineers. Um, so used a very hands-on engineering approach, um, and as a re result, they started producing these units in, in, in small modules quite quite quickly, and they have now installed um, uh, about 15 machines, although uh, truth be told that uh, uh, some of these machines are just one or, or two modules, uh, so that's not very big, but at least they, they, they are really learning, and they've just, uh, for their large project in Iceland now, uh, they've actually um, uh, adjusted their their technology, uh, so they're kind of moving into to, into their second generation now. Um, now, global thermostat is a is a bit different. So, so to my uh, feeling, they have taken a much more scientific approach. So they've been uh, they kind of spun off of out of Georgia Tech um, to some extent at least, and um, they've been optimizing their adsorbent system very much before actually building and or selling plants. Um, I think so far they have just built two pre-commercial plants at the SRI test center in uh, in California. Um, so, so there, it, I mean that that's going in a in a very different pace. Um, and then interestingly, uh, Exxon Mobil um, is now trying to help them scale up their technology um, because they've also adjusted it so that they can do post combustion capture. Um, now, because Climeworks just went on, there's a lot of uncertainty, or no, not uncertainty, but there's there's a lot that is not known in, in let's say, the, the, the public space. Um, so the science is actually lagging the development uh, commercially a little bit. Um, and quite some work needs to be done on understanding the fundamentals that we don't know yet. Um, and for instance, we've stu studied the fundamentals of water CO2 co-absorption, 
uh, developing new isotherm models for that and uh, discovering how that uh, may influence uh, the, the adsorption process. Um, and once once that is done, so so that that information is not really out there in the in the scientific literature yet. Uh, only then can we start designing optimal cycles using uh, computer-based models, and that's also really in its infancy. Um, and that's another area we where um, where where my team is trying to make headway. So I wanted to uh, I wanted to leave it to that. Um, yeah, pretty sure. and uh, happy to listen to the other speakers. Great, thank you, Minded. So you've given us some insight into some of the existing uh, commercial companies uh, that have kind of led the way in kind of promoting direct air capture and kind of raising awareness, I guess. And now it sounds like there's some um, commercial interests now from Exxon you mentioned. And, and so this kind of now, now kind of leads the way, potentially paving the way to kind of get DAC out there. Um, and next, we're going to have uh, Professor Martin Trussler to give his perspective. Um, and Martin has a background um, where he his research is um, focused on improving fundamental understanding of uh, thermophysical properties of fluids uh, with a special focus on sort of systems that are relevant to the oil field processes as well as carbon capture and storage. So he's going to provide his insights on direct air capture now. So thanks, Martin. Take it away. OK, thank you so much. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted, Mindy, to hear, hear your, your thoughts and, and, and relieved that uh, you didn't say exactly what I'm planning to say, which is, which is good. Um, so personally, I think I started from a, a very sceptical position on direct air capture, but I, I, I've come to realise through thinking about the sort of like the, the broad piece of it, that this probably has an essential role. And I think the question to answer it in the most direct way. I mean, you could say that uh, direct air capture certainly isn't going to save us all by itself, but as a part of our armory, it's probably going to be needed uh, to address the unavoidable emissions that will still be there after we've done all of the other right things that we should be doing first, which I would categorize as one, two, and three. Number one, demand reduction. Number two, fuel switching. In other words, uh, moving our energy requirements, uh, meeting our energy requirements from either very low or zero carbon sources and CCS. So we need to have all of those things done. And looking at the, the thing as a whole, I mean, it's clear there are no magic bullets to this horrendous challenge that we face uh, internationally. And we probably have to develop most of the competing technologies and deploy them because none of them are going to do the job on their own. So I had the opportunity to think about this a little bit over the last uh, year and, and made reference to uh, a Royal Society and Royal Academy of Engineering report published in 2018 on the slightly broader field of greenhouse gas removal in, in, in general. And that report concluded in the context of the, the UK that we probably needed to be capturing or, or removing something on the order of 130 million tonnes per annum. And they saw that as being split more or less 50-50 between land-based and uh, engineered solutions. So then you start to sort of get an idea of what scale might we need to deploy this on if we're going to address those emissions we'll not be able to get rid of by other means. So then you know, the engineered uh, uh, solutions, which are the ones I, I know something about, uh, the, the leading ones obviously are BEX and direct air capture. Uh, there are some other alternatives, but the, those are the ones which look like they're, they're, they're in with a running in the, in the coming decade or two. Uh, and the Royal Society report suggested that, that perhaps direct air capture might take up about a third. So you'd be looking at something, a third of the engineered contribution. So we might be looking uh, in the UK at needing to capture from the atmosphere 25 million tonnes per annum, capture and store 25 million tonnes per annum. So is it feasible and uh, how big would the plant be? Um, I'm not going to claim that I'm the, you know, the best person, the best qualified person to answer that question, but having thought about it a bit, it turns out that I, I think the plant doesn't need to be so huge. Uh, so one vision, and, and there, are, there are many visions you could have, but one vision for a plant capturing a million tons a year uh, would be, think of a cartwheel, an arrangement with a, a, a hub, rim and spokes. So uh, based on an adsorption type technology. So at the hub, you have a, a heat and power plant. 
uh, you've got your CO2 conditioning and export compressor station. So all the CO2 is leaving through through the hub, and uh, the hub is where the heat and power for your, your capture process comes from. Then on the rim, you have a, a number of clusters of direct air capture units, and we know these have to be spread out. You can't put them too close to each other, otherwise, you know, you, you, you've got depleted CO2 or depleted air going to the next unit. So maybe around 50 clusters, uh, each with first stage compression. So they're feeding medium pressure CO2 back to the back to the hub. And then the spokes, of course, the spokes are, are along which the, the heat and the power and the CO2 move between the rim and the hub. So if you think about you know, what, how are you going to power this thing? So I said CHP, so it could be, for example, BEX. BEX would be a wonderful thing to uh, combine with direct air capture. So we'd be using bioenergy and capturing the CO2 from that, as well as capturing CO2 from the atmosphere, uh, resulting in a machine that will consume biomass, uh, withdraw CO2 from the atmosphere, put it underground and do nothing else. Uh, optionally, it might have the flexibility to produce electricity. But I think we can recognize that direct air capture could be powered in many ways. For example, renewable electricity could be used or even natural gas if you capture the, C, uh, capture the CO2 from it. And some estimates indicate even if you didn't, you would have uh, still have net negative uh, uh, CO2. So in this vision, I think uh, each of these clusters, and I'm not going to talk about the technology, I imagine it's an absorption type, but each would have multiple units. Uh, because they'd be delivering around 20 kilotons per cluster. But it looks like a 20 kiloton cluster could have a footprint of only a hectare. Uh, so you have to spread them out a bit. You could probably have a million ton facility on one or a few square kilometers, depending on the geography. So not so huge, and we need 25 of them. So it's, it's in terms of the land, um, maybe not a huge um, requirement. In terms of the location, it could be quite remote. I think that the, the requirement here is that the distance to CO2 transmission infrastructure isn't too great. But it doesn't have to be that small either if you build at the scale of a, of a million tons. I mean, I haven't done the calculation, but I, I imagine at that scale, it would be economic to build some pipeline. So I think the criterion there is not too far away from uh, national CO2 infrastructure. And um, that then, of course, brings you to the realization that we can't do DAC unless we have large scale CCS because the infrastructure won't be there and it won't be economic to have the infrastructure just for that operation. So final comments, uh, thinking about cost again, it's not perhaps the thing I'm best qualified at, but I thought about it a bit. Uh, obviously, of huge concern. Although at a certain level, we'll just have to pay whatever it costs. If we want to get to net zero and we've done everything else, we are going to have to pay probably a lot for that last bit. Um, and it's going to, of course, be much more expensive than capturing from, from point sources. And I like to think about this in terms of uh, you know, cost per decade of enrichment. Um, and by that measure, actually, uh, DAC technology doesn't look too bad. It's just that you've got more decades to cover because you're starting at, let's say, 0.04% rather than 4%, 10%, 30% or whatever for power and industrial sources. Um, and the balance, I think, of CapEx and OpEx is also quite important. Uh, and, and just a, a, a leaving thought that maybe if, if you can get the CapEx down, no matter what the OpEx, if you can get the CapEx down, then you could imagine some of this plant being on intermittent operation and uh, you know, use, using renewable electricity when it's uh, free or negative uh, cost. Uh, but of course, that, that relies on you not having a huge capex because if, if the capital is expensive, you need your asset running at capacity the whole time. All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Those are my few thoughts and um, hand back to the next speaker. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. That, that really much uh, sets out sort of the scene and, and the landscape of, you know, where DAC kind of is, 
uh, what the key challenges are and you've kind of set up this sort of um, perspective from a systems level where you know what do we need to think about in terms of why DAC is needed and you mentioned the different sort of pathways of first reducing energy demand and, and looking at all our other options and then DAC's kind of coming in to kind of mop up whatever um, residual emissions there are. And so uh, in addition to that thinking about the impact infrastructure so th those were some very interesting points that you raised about um, the land requirements maybe not being as high or as large as we had first anticipated um, but also where will the energy come from and you've kind of highlighted some sort of potential sources that are low carbon um, which is I think a key factor um, but now we're going to move on to Ronnie and, and Ronnie's uh a senior at Imperial College. So he's going to, pro, um, he's studying transport and adsorption phenomena in porous media uh, with applications ranging from subsurface CO2 to industrial gas separation. So he's going to give us his perspectives on where the direct air capture is and what his thoughts are. So thanks, Ronnie. Take it away. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, May. Thank you, Mindert and, and Martin, for introducing the, the topic. So I, indeed, I also thought about starting with some general comments about my opinion on, on data capture and whether we should use it as a climate change mitigation technology. I agree, obviously, with Mindert and, and, and Martin that we should do it. And I want to emphasize a, a point that maybe was implicit in the previous comments, but my opinion is that we should do it, but if this is implemented with subsurface carbon storage, right? So it's not only so we are not really talking only about data capture, but it's data capture with carbon storage, right? Which is often referred to as uh, DACs. And, and so the, the, the reason for that is, it was already mentioned before, um, we need to decarbonize, right? Our, our society, uh, power industry, um, uh, our own households as well, but we cannot decarbonize everything. So we need to deal with these residual uh, emissions. You know, they might be associated with aviation, agriculture, the chemical industry is also quite challenging, right? Because of all the carbon based products that, that we have. And so those residual emissions are not um, negligible. Um, I read somewhere that they might account up to one fourth of the global greenhouse gas emissions. And so we need these negative emission technologies and, and, and direct air capture is one of them. Uh, but indeed, there is this important element of durability that we need to consider, right? So we need to get the carbon out of the atmosphere um, but we also need to keep it out of it for as long as, as possible. And, and, and so if we are able to do that by combining it with subsurface CO2 storage, uh, then we have a, a, a very powerful tool, right? Because we have a, an engineered solution uh, for climate change mitigation with storage durability in the order of millennia. That's what we typically consider, right, for, for subsurface storage. And so this raises two important uh, points. Uh, let's say, or features of, of DAX. One is that it differs from other natural carbon removal solutions right, that are available there that are very important, but um, they have this issue of durability, right? If you think about uh, tree planting or soil carbon sequestration, you're talking about a durability of one to 100 years. And, and the second one, which is also very important, that was mentioned briefly before, is that often uh, DAX is uh, sold as a technology that can be implement and anywhere. So that's not strictly uh, true, right? Because uh, the effect effectiveness of, of DAX depends largely on the availability, in my opinion, of CO2 storage, geological storage, but also on the availability of other type of energies, uh, sources like renewable sources that you will need to, to power your, your DAC plant, right? If you want to be net uh, carbon negative. And, and so Conclusion, I think if, if we are supporting negative emission technologies, in particular DAX, it means, in my opinion, that we need to deploy uh, CO2 storage as soon as possible and as widely as possible, um, because it is an essential element, element for, for closing the, the carbon cycle. And, and so this leads to, to, to an important point that when we discuss the deployment of, of DAX, we should prioritize the deployment of conventional CCS, right? And, and, and there are two reasons for that. One is is because, yeah, this was mentioned before, DAX alone uh, will not be able to handle all the current emissions of CO2. And so capturing large scale CO2 emission, like from, from industrial clusters, will go already a long way to, uh, to, to reduce uh, the current CO2 emission. And the other one is that indeed, if we do implement conventional um, CCS, let's say, this will lead to the establishment of a CCS infrastructure. Right, which is what you need if you want to then deploy 
ducks on a, on a large scale. So that's where my general comments. Um, I have some other points, but I can stop here and, and let Paul talk and you know, we can make these points later. Great, thank you, Ronnie. Uh, that was re really useful because um, yeah, the, the storage piece and that that word durability of storage is like kind of a key factor. And I think when we're thinking of negative emissions, you've got many different options and you're right, the durability of that storage is going to be a key factor. And if we're thinking climate change mitigation, we need to kind of lock that CO2 away for a sufficiently long amount of time. So very good point there. So we'll now move on to um, Professor Paul Fennell. Uh, and his research uh, investigates approaches to decarbonize the energy industrial sectors, um, looking at efficiency improvement, uh, integration of CCS technologies, and also explores uh, different negative emission technologies. So he's worked a lot on BEX and now also direct air capture. So Paul, please take the floor. <laughs> right, uh, hello everybody. Um, I guess uh, like Martin, oh. I started um, skeptical about uh, air capture, but uh, unlike Martin, I think I've stayed um, relatively uh, sceptical about, uh, I'll say direct air capture. Um, I think that Bex has got some uh, significant um, uh, potential and also I should say um, there's some industrial processes that you can link in quite nicely with um, uh, CO2 capture and if they're burning wastes, MSW, you get the biogenic fraction of that and you can capture the CO2 and, uh, you know, everything's good. Um, but we have recently started looking at actually modelling um, some of the direct air capture processes. So um, we've modelled some of the um, uh, Climeworks uh, processes and we're finding it's very very expensive um you know we're looking at uh, 400 to 600 dollars a ton at the minimum which I'll, I'll i'll freely admit is less than the societal cost of um co2 capture but i do think that there's going to be better um ways to um certainly get very very far along the decarbonization um trajectory and i think the last bit probably would be uh, done with Bex. Uh, in the words of the uh, late great David Mackay in his book, um, this is the very last thing that we should be doing. So um, my view is we have to do everything else and then start to really um, think about air capture as a, um, as a process. Um, we also need to not forget the sort of boring stuff, which is um, the golden triangle in industry. Um, improving insulation, improving heat integration, upgrading motors and pumps, all of these sorts of things that um, even though they actually save money are not being done right now. And before we actually start to, to significantly um, push for technologies which will cost us vast amounts of money per tonne of CO2, I think we need to make sure that we um, uh, get much better at um, industrial synergy and at industrial um, uh, efficiency. Um, we have got plenty of CO2 available at low cost and high concentration for CCS. Um, quick back of, the calc back of the envelope calculation says that, um, a, uh, that uh, CO2 capture from the air is going to cost at least three times as much electricity or energy, sorry, as CO2 capture from a um, uh, power station. And if you look at the amount of energy that you're taking into do CCS on a uh, gas-fired power station, you're looking at maybe 20% of the um, output of that station to do straight CCS. So equivalent, you'd be looking at, uh, you know, if you, if you just emitted the CO2 from that uh, gas-fired power station and then captured the CO2 from the air, you'd be looking at 60% equivalent of the electricity that you're um, producing to recapture that uh, CO2, which seems uh, very um, uh, challenging as an idea. Uh, last thing, I'm going to pick my up on uh, Climeworks being a commercial company. I would like to find out if any of these things are uh, commercial without significant subsidy or, you know, somebody's paying um, a very high premium for the CO2 
which I don't think is a reproducible model at large scale. Um, you know, uh, it's fine if somebody wants to say, ah, we're capturing our CO2 and we're using it for greenhouses and doing this. But, you know, when you actually need to capture gigatons, there's not going to be somebody saying, hey, I'm going to want to pay 10 times more than uh, I need to. Um, and the last point on free electricity, um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to push back on Martin a little bit there and say that the power companies are going to try very hard not to actually um, have spare electricity on the grid. Yes, um, we do. You know, we are seeing times in uh, Germany when the electricity grid is going negative in price, but they're hours a week. And even if you can go down uh, very far down in the low capex um, uh, idea, you know, you're still got to have quite big machines in order to get that volume of air through a um, through anything. Um, so I don't think you're going to be able to get that far down in the capital cost curve where they're going to compete. And even if there is free electricity around at any time, then that's going to be, you know, you're competing there against, um, say, battery storage and other storage technologies to actually um, take that electricity. And uh, I think that given the drops in prices of the um, energy storage and the, the grid services that uh, battery storage, etc., can offer to the grid, um, that might be something that would be more likely to be prioritised. Anyway, there you go. Fight, fight, fight. Um, uh, Professor Fennell's not known for uh, uh, not uh, for keeping his views uh, entirely to himself. Not a shrinking violet. We can always violet. count on you, Paul. We can always count on you, Paul. <laughs> Throwing punches. <laughs> uh, so... That was some really useful insights there, Paul, from the sort of other side and kind of challenging the ideas. And, you know, a lot of people do have, you know, they start off at skeptic, as a skeptic when it comes to direct air capture and then they may be swayed and they may never be swayed over to the other side, um, as with you. Uh, so Join us on the live these... side, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we have a, a question here in the chat, um, which may further... Uh, provoke some of the panel members um, on this idea of um, utilization of the CO2. Um, so here we've talked about, you know, the challenging economics of direct air capture. So it's going to be very uh, costly. And we've kind of talked about storing it and storing the carbon. Um, but the question is, do you think that carbon utilization, for example, synthetic fuels uh, or synthesis of sort of chemicals in the pharmaceutical um, industry, for instance, uh, could they be uh, options that provide uh, sufficient economic incentive to develop direct air capture? And maybe it might be a suitable option because uh, atmospheric air has, you know, low concentrations of problematic impurities. So doing direct air capture gives you sort of a cleaner CO2 to use for these uh, utilization pathways compared to post combustion capture. So uh, this could be directed first to Martin or then uh, maybe some of the other panel members may have their also comments. I know Paul is ready to go, but we'll start with Martin first. <laughs> okay, well, I'll make a brief, a, a, a brief comment. I, I'm still on the sceptical box with regard to um, uh, utilisation of, uh, of CO2. I mean, I, I think at a certain level, uh, CO2 utilisation has a bit to offer. And you know, if you think about jet fuel, for example, maybe we will be looking at synthesizing that from captured CO2. I, I'm not convinced that uh, the purity issue is really uh, important in, in connection with where your CO2 comes from. And we're, we're going to have a lot of CO2 available. And just if you, if you look across all the things you could make from it, there's a huge mismatch between the amount of CO2 that we need to capture and the amount that could ever be used in, in different processes. So I think at the edges, yes, it can be a good thing, but at the scale of things, I personally don't see it as particularly big. That's my view. <laughs> so Paul, did you want to chip in and then mind it? I think you also had <laughs> something to say. Okay, Thanks, on the, um, on the um, uh, clean up side of things, I mean, you know, most of the costs that people will throw around for CCS 
say 60 70 pounds a ton even if you go up to 100 pounds a ton um you know that's for co2 that is pipeline grade um and has been cleaned up to the uh, grade that you can put it into a pipeline so um i'd rather start out with pretty clean co2 um that uh, and then if necessary buff it up a little bit um at 100 pounds a ton than very clean co2 you know define very clean anyway i mean there's going to be some uh, impurities in it anyway um which is costing you six seven hundred pounds a ton um there i mean as soon as you put any of these um co2 utilization technologies in at sufficient scale that they will do anything for the uh, global amount of co2 then they will swamp whatever market they actually are put into with the exception of fuels but then fuels are a terrible idea for a different reason because you know you're starting out say for example you've got electricity and you're using that electricity you want to split uh, water to make hydrogen and then add that to your co2 and make methanol and all of these sorts of things you do it well to well to motive force in a vehicle and you know electricity store it in a battery use it in an electric vehicle about 85 percent efficient electricity split water take that water react it to form methanol burn the methanol in an in internal combustion engine you're getting down to about i think when i did the calculation first which was about 10 years ago um it was about 14 percent efficient right and it's not improved that much since then so my views on fuels as well bad idea and they're the only thing that you can actually put in sufficient quantities of co2 in order to make a difference to worldwide actual um, co2 emissions and then at the end if you make a fuel you burn it and you release the co2 anyway so you know there's better things that you can do yeah i i, I, I wanted to place this in in the towards net zero perspective uh because you know in the end that's what the seminar series are about um um, so I think I started off as a CO2 utilization skeptic <laughs> and then I was made the co-director of CO2 utilization and there you go, right? So sometimes it's good to have a skeptic uh, in charge of something. Um, so I've done some life cycle assessment and, and system analysis work on, on this and basically the only way that you can make CO2 utilization into either fuels or chemicals um, because you can also mineralize it and that's a completely different story so we shouldn't forget about uh, that part of utilization but okay into fuels and chemicals the only way that you can make that compatible to a uh, you know to net zero or to the paris 1.5 degree scenario is by using completely recycled co2 from the atmosphere um, um, and by using and, and co2 utilization or conversion needs quite a lot of energy um so that 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 must be then renewable so if we are to do you know fuels or chemicals which i'm also in some instances it, it may be useful jet fuel uh putting it in a car very definitely not completely agree with paul there um but then it should be it should come from the atmosphere either through biomass or through direct air capture um, there is another point that I have been wanting to make, and, and that is, I was very pleased to hear both Paul and and um, and, and Martin mention the, the the thing of energy efficiency, right, and reducing the amount of energy uh, that we use in the first place. And you will find, and, and Duck is no different. I I, I will I will I will, um, I will I will gladly admit admit that. But you will find that many of the technology options that are being pushed very hard at the moment, so so hydrogen through electrolysis. Um, uh, 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 direct air capture, C2 util utilization, they use heaps of, of renewable electricity because basically in, in my mind also direct air capture will, will, will work completely on renewable electricity, otherwise there's simply no point. Um, um, and that we don't have that. And, and, and we will have a, an incredibly hard time already decarbonizing our complete electricity system 
without even the addition of, of heaps of, of uh, electrolysis-based hydrogen, direct air capture and CO2 utilization products. Um, so I find that very interesting and I, I know I'm, I, I plead guilty. I mean, I, 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 I argue that ducks should be also only based on renewable electricity, ideally. Um, but we don't have that. So I think we have a bit of an issue there. And, and that's where the science and, and perhaps, you know, the reality uh, are, are mismatch a little bit. Ronnie, did you want to say anything here with the utilization piece? Do you agree? <laughs> or, I, I, no, no, I agree with, with what was said, so not much to add. <laughs> Great. So th thanks everyone for your perspectives on that topic. And we're going to go to Jeff, who's put his hand up. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question, Jeff, please? Thanks, Mai. Thanks, uh, all of you. Interesting perspectives. Um, positions that uh, I might have expected, but a few <laughs> interesting sidelines there. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about, um, strikes me, you know, if we do have uh, DAX um, contributing to negative emissions, and we can't do it all by BEX, say, or um, natural uh, means, then cost is probably the overriding factor. And so I just wonder what your thoughts were on how are we going to bring the cost of direct air capture down? Is it going to be that, as the hope is with the conventional capture from processes, that uh, a combination of uh, building at scale and learning by doing as it does with any chemical plant, brings the price down. And then we have a few tweaks because of technology improvements with time. Or is, is the DAX process not susceptible to that? And that, you know, there are some inherent problems uh, in the, the efficiency of the process, given that you're starting from very low CO2 concentrations. That means that um, it will be very difficult to bring both the CAPEX and the OPEX down. I just wonder what your feelings were that because it's often said you know it's now four or six hundred but in uh, in ten years time it'll be down to a hundred and then we'll get it lower than that and so I just wondered what your thoughts were and you if you've got any good ideas you could offer the likes of Climeworks and other people. Uh, so mind that you had your <laughs> hand up first did you want to say something and then I'll have Ronnie I think had something to say too. Well, 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 just that—that that was a point that I wanted to bring up. So I'm really happy with your with your question, Jeff, and it you also give me something to think about. I mean, in general, all technologies uh, once deployed, and that's why I'm so happy with the Climeworks model. Just go and do it, and then see where you know where you can uh, uh, improve your 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 um, your machine. But all, all process technology and all other technologies go through learning by doing, right? Technological learning and, and, and basically for processing technologies, the learning rates uh, for each doubling of the deployment of technology range between zero and 25%. 25% uh, is very aggressive and ambitious, and that's only for highly re replicatable installations. Uh, sometimes I think for SMRs uh, it has been reported, although I I'm not 100% sure if that was actually accurate, but okay, that's what's been reported, right? And direct air capture is, is uh, with solid sorbent at least, is highly modular and, and therefore many replications uh, are made and therefore you might expect good learning rates, I, I suspect in any case above 10%, uh, at least for the capital costs. But uh, I think it's very true what you say that, that there is, of course, a thermodynamic barrier uh, um, for capturing the CO2 from a dilute airstream and perhaps uh, that might limit it. Um, I will say that carbon engineering, and that's not solid sorbent based, but you know, it's a, it's a, a potassium hydroxide based uh, process. They are very firm in their belief that their plant one million ton um, uh, direct air capture plant is, is going to be $250 per ton or less. Uh, the reason for that is simple. They can get, I think, 200 from the uh, low carbon uh, fuel standard in, in California and then another 40 from uh, 45Q. Um, so they're very optimistic. <laughs> Let, let's see, right? Ronnie, did you want to chip in there? 
Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, I wanted to make a, a point in the sense that I think the design specific specification for, for direct air capture differ from, uh, let's say, conventional uh, CO2 capture in the way that you don't really have a constraint on achieving, let's say, 90% capture rate. So you, you don't necessarily need to achieve a specific throughput right, of your plant, meaning that you don't have a constraint on the volume of air that you can process. So this means that actually you can design your your process to you know to focus about purity you know less on less on recovery and and therefore you can optimize it to to achieve let's say a minimal cost and energy use per kilo, per kilogram of co2 that you might uh, capture and so in the sense in that sense i think you know what we see around these days which is climbworks and and, and the other companies as well and minder mentioned it as well so these have not been entirely you know, optimize, I think. So there is room for for rethinking about the way uh, the process is uh, is designed. So I think they were excellent in 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 showing that the technology can work, right? You can you can capture uh, CO2 from dilute uh, streams, um, uh, but I think there is a lot of room to to improve the the process by by thinking about um, these these aspects of um, of of you know the lack of constraint, let's say, on the recovery that you need to. That you need to achieve. That was a really good point, Ronnie. Yeah, no one really talks about that capture rate um, topic, and, and you've highlighted a really important point there. Uh, Paul, you had a comment to add to this as well, I think. I think uh, what I'd say is that uh, a visionary engineer uh, once said something which uh, holds true today uh, You cannot change the laws of physics. Um, in this case, maybe it's not the uh, laws of physics, it's the laws of thermodynamics, which uh, I like to point out in my lectures are, are laws and not guidelines. Um, I think that the fundamental issue of the very large amounts of air that you're going to have to move through these things, together with the energy costs for scrubbing from uh, you know 400 parts per million, are going to combine to very much limit the lower the, the lower bounds on the cost. You're still going to need things like motors. You're still going to need electricity. You're still going to need um, some sort of vessel to actually do the um, uh, contacting. Whether or not that vessel's made of you know plastic or concrete or something like that i mean there's there's potential to make these things cheaper in those ways but they're still going to have to be very big um you know in total however you actually make them because you've got to get a very large amount of air through the um through them so i would be skeptical on the level to which you can actually learn by doing i, I think that there's going to be metal things in there there's there's chemicals you have to produce there's all sorts of different things and at a certain level you know there will be a base price and i don't think it's anywhere near the sort of uh, 40 dollars a ton that uh, um is being touted by some of the global thermostat guys or um that sort of thing so I wouldn't put a figure on it. What I do think will, will happen over, over time is that direct air capture will become cheaper. Um, because we have those extra decades of enrichment to cover, there certainly are limits to how low we can make it, but I, I'm not going to put a figure on it. But the other thing that's going to happen over the same period of time is that the price that society is willing to pay for that last bit of CO2 is going to go up. And I think there's a, a, let's say, a fighting chance that the curves are going to cross. And there will be a point at which this is pseudo economic because we are so desperate uh, and everything else is done to the max. We're going to need it. Great, thanks, Martin. Um, Minder, do you want to, you had your hand up as well? Yeah, no, I, I so so I agree. Um, it's just a it's just a simple matter of a marginal cost curve, and at some point we need to scrub out these last bits of CO two. Period. Uh, you know, again, if we are to make the Paris Paris Agreement or or a net zero 
goals, right? Okay. And, and the other option is we don't make them, which you know, is, is, is an equally viable outcome. But um, I, I'm, I'm going to push push back on Paul a little bit, but maybe tease him a little bit as well, but I don't think he'll mind. Um, and, and that also has to do with that marginal cost curve, right? So, so suppose that we can do negative emissions through bags and, and um, no, no, suppose we can do that. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually fairly easy. We could do it. We're already doing it today. I think there's a, an ethanol plant in the US where we yeah. also capture and store the CO2. So, so, you know, done. We can, we can deploy that now. But uh, f um, just for, an, for another, this was for, for sustainable hydrogen from biomass. I, I, I had a look at the, the, the estimates that the Earth system model people and the, and the um, integrated assessment model people put on the availability of biomass, right? And, and well, I, I will gladly admit that they are very much smarter than I am. Um, but these amounts are not great. And even if they, uh, if, if they make assumptions on, on marginal, uh, marginal lands and, and all that, um, they come to a, val a value of biomass for bioenergy availability twice or triple that what we have today, just that. Um, and that's, you, you know, and, and the, the very high ranges are also dismissed as not very realistic by other people who've done then their, their, um, uh, their reviews of, of those studies. So my point is, I, I, I don't believe that, for instance, Bex alone can, can do that. And, I, and that's why I do believe that further down the marginal cost curve, DAC will come and, and, and we will need it to reach that net zero. I'll just quickly uh, respond. I think, you know, I, I, I've said uh, um, earlier, you know, I think it's the last thing that we should do. And I, I agree that it is a thing we should do, but I think that it's, you know, it's something that maybe there's a big push to do um, right now. And I think we need to get on with doing the other things that we need to do with much greater urgency than um, developing the sort of DAC technologies. I think that there's, I, I, I think that there's a moral hazard implicit in um, putting, all, putting a significant volume of our eggs in the basket of DAC right now before we've actually done many of the other um, technologies to anywhere near the level that we need to actually do and these these things that are significantly cheaper i agree with martin that we might um well move down the uh, curve to um you know to a point where the societal cost of carbon is is so high that uh, dac will become um feasible um i i don't know whether or not the public will come with the scientists and engineers uh, recently, it has it has become clear in the UK that maybe what I think the government and the uh, country should be doing is not the same as what the um, people on the street think. So um, you know, we we might have some some challenges actually bringing people with us. But yeah, I mean, fundamentally, I'm I'm being a little bit harsh on uh, direct air capture um, because. I think that we need to um, uh, push on other things first and push hard. Great. Uh, Martin, do you wanted to add a point here? Yes, I mean, I, I, I think Paul's comments uh, uh, illuminate the difficulty of the choices that, that we face. Um, to a certain extent, I think all of the speakers are agreeing that we should do the other things first. But only first in a certain sense, and, and, and this came out in the in the Royal Society Royal Academy report, uh, where they recommended that um, DAC be invested in to at least to a certain extent now, for the obvious reason that if we wake up in 2050 and realise that we can't do without it, it isn't going to come just out of thin air, is it? It's, we, we, we need to put a certain level, pun intended, a certain <laughs> level of efforts uh into developing this on industrial scale uh otherwise it won't be there when we need it so unfortunately there are no silver bullets we do actually need to do almost everything and all at once 
very nice point there, Martin. Uh, so, Jeff, you had your hand up. Would you like to? Well, I just wanted to. Uh, I think that was a very interesting discussion. Thanks very much. Um, and I just just could, picking up on Martin's point about he wasn't going to put a figure on what the baseline might be. I think it might be a useful thing for the thermodynamics community to do that. We could we'd have to put error bars on it, of course, but I think it would actually provide a benchmark that would guide uh, as and when D, uh, DAC might enter the picture. Klaus Lackner's tried to do a thermodynamic analysis which puts the best spin on this and says that it's even more efficient than conventional <laughs> capture, which it isn't, of course. Um, it's all about the decadal transition as you go down to lower numbers. But I, I, I think it's something for us to think about that's something that might be a useful contribution, that's all. Uh, one one point, I guess, we've kind of talked about it, deploying DAC in a very sort of general sense, but there's going to be a regional factor here that in, that is involved, and some countries won't be able to afford DAC, for instance. Some countries will, um, and then you know whether they've got the infrastructure that's ready to kind of integrate something like DAC in is another aspect to kind of think about. And like, ha have any of the panel members kind of given this some thought on like? you know, the implications of where you can actually deploy DAC and like which regional context, which countries and who will actually be willing to pay for it. And the political will is kind of another th factor that comes into play. So um, I'd, I kind of want to get someone's thoughts who would like to answer this first. We'll start with, we'll go with uh, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, we, we have started thinking about um, some of the uh, uh, regional specific issues, only very, um, only very sort of uh, early steps at the moment, because we, we've started looking at deployment in, uh, as you may well know, uh, my <laughs> uh, in Saudi Arabia or other uh, countries, um, which may be somewhat hotter than uh, uh, the UK, and we've found that there are some fairly um, important regional differences in terms of the, the actual um, temperatures that you're taking in the ambient air at. The humidity of the ambient air is, is very important, um, and I think it's actually something that does need some fairly careful thinking. I mean, um, I haven't yet really got to the stage where I where I know whether or not you should be putting them all up at well I suppose not at the North Pole because they'll probably just sink into the ocean um, <laughs> in a, about 20 years um, maybe at the South Pole um, so I don't know whether or not they should be situated in very very cold places um, with a lot of wind or very very hot places with a lot of solar um, but uh, uh, it's certainly something that that we're starting to think about in the in the work that we're doing on on this thanks paul does anyone else have anything to add before we we start wrapping up because i've got the five minute mark <laughs> signal that's popping up uh did anyone want to add their thoughts on this no? <laughs> so th thanks everyone so thanks to the panel members for providing your insights and your thoughts on on this topic i think direct air capture it's still very new and it, it, we are still just kind of learning about what we are, um, the different technologies and how they might be designed and deployed. We know sort of clear challenges from an engineering perspective that, you know, it's going to have a high energy requirement and obviously a high cost as a, a result. Um, but we're still trying to develop like ways on trying to reduce that cost. And I think um, right now, as Paul mentioned, that it's going to struggle to be deployed without some sort of um, benefit or support from uh, government or from uh, other companies. And I think this is going to be a key challenge. <laughs> it's not something that you're going to get much return on. It's it's whether we're willing to pay for it or not. Um, so thanks everyone for your providing your thoughts and thanks <laughs> to the uh, people who've asked questions. Um, yeah, so I um, guess uh, hopefully everyone found that quite useful. Um, I think direct air capture has some potential, but uh, we still have to address a lot of these uh, challenges with the technical and the cost issues. Um, and yeah, so I'll hand it over to Jeff to do the final wrap up. Thanks very much, Maya, and thanks very much indeed to the five of you, and uh, particularly to the, uh, thanks for organising it, Maya, and thanks to the panellists. I think that was 
a tremendous discussion and you bring some great insights into that and it's just the sort of um, seminar we, we should have as part of our Towards Net Zero series that looks at the bigger picture and compares uh, different technologies and some of the controversial issues. So I'd like you all, first of all, just to unmute mute your mics and uh, thank our panellists in the usual way for a tremendous session. Thank you very much. I suspect there's a lot to be continued. And uh, just to preview uh, forthcoming weeks, uh, next week uh, we have a well-deserved break. Uh, of Good Friday next week. So our next seminar will be on the 9th of April, the following Friday. And uh, this is going to be Raghaya Dejan, who's a PhD student with Niall McDowell, uh, talking about his work in CEP. I don't have a title yet, but uh, watch this space. And uh, I wish you all a good weekend and uh, uh, a good Easter. Uh, as good as it can be in the current circumstances. And uh, if I don't see you before, we'll see you back after Easter at the next seminar. So thanks again, everybody. Have a good weekend. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, particularly, Mayat, for, for coming and uh, joining us all the way from Harriet Watt. <laughs> Oh yes, it's it's very far indeed. It uh, was quite the trip. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll pay your expenses. Don't worry. <laughs> so generous. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Jeff.